Good morning, church family. We have gathered here this morning to worship our great God, and we are called into that worship by Psalm 105, verses 1 through 3. I'll give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praises to him, and tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Brothers and sisters, in accordance to God's word, let us join together this morning to glory in the holy name of our God. with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, you have proven yourself to be holy, merciful, and mighty. And this morning we gather together to do what we were created to do, to worship you, to glorify you, and enjoy you forever. And this morning we get a glimpse of what eternity would be like, where all of God's people will be gathered before your throne, worshiping you. Even still, Father, we stand in need this morning, and we acknowledge that there is no way for us to truly worship you apart from your enabling grace. And so, Holy Spirit, we say come. Come and do what only you can do. Give us your grace that we may worship you rightly. 
bring the dead to life, and unveil our eyes that we may behold the glory of our resurrected King. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, and all the God's people said together, amen. Good morning, church family. As those perfectly loved by our holy triune God, let us praise the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together using the litany of thanksgiving printed in the bulletins. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Gracious Father, giver of all good things for our home on earth and for your unfailing mercy. Christ, our Redeemer, for your sacrifice on the cross and for arising from death so that we might live. We give Holy Spirit, giver of life, for your abiding presence in our lives and for comforting and guiding us. We give you thanks, praise, and glory. O triune God, to you be glory and praise now and forever. Brothers and sisters, we worship an eternal and unchanging God. And one of the benefits of that is that if we know that God was merciful yesterday, then we can trust that God will be merciful today. And so with that in mind, let us go to our eternal Father, confessing our sins, trusting that he will meet us once again with his mercy. So at this time, if you are able and willing, I invite you to kneel as we go to our Father with our corporate prayer confession followed by our individual and silent prayers of confession. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our risen and exalted King, we bow before you in humble confession, for you have graciously rescued and redeemed us, but we have often forgotten your love, neglected your commandments, and forsaken your ways. Please forgive our hardness of heart, our stubbornness of mind, our foolishness and pride. Restore within us an obedient spirit that we may render joyful worship at your feet and willing service in your kingdom for the everlasting glory of your name. Now, Father, hear us as we make our individual and silent prayers of confession. Amen. You may return to your seats. Brothers and sisters, receive these words of assurance of divine pardon from Romans 4 and 5. Jesus was delivered up from our, for our trespasses and raised for our justification. 
Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Church family, if you have placed your faith in Christ, be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Now at this time, as those who have received so freely, we get to respond as an act of worship by giving freely. As the plates make their way, their way around, you'll see listed in your bulletin the different ways by which you are able to give. But now let us continue in worship by bringing to the throne of God the gifts of God. <laughs> Let's pray and thank the Lord together. 
Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd. And like sheep, we have all gone astray, and yet, Lord, you have continued to pursue us time and time again. And, Lord, for that we say thank you, not only with our mouths, but with our gifts and with sacrifice. Lord, we pray your blessing over these gifts. We ask, Lord, that you would use it for your glory and for the benefit of those who bear your image. Lord, we thank you again for how much you have given to us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, welcome everyone to Sunday morning worship. If you are an extrovert, this is probably your favorite time of the service. If you're an introvert, uh, the restrooms are right out their door to your right. Uh, but I invite you all to stand and to greet one another. the Second Presbyterian Church. We are so glad to be able to join together and worship again. I want to offer a special welcome to our guests. We are especially glad that you decided to join us this morning. Just have a few announcements. The first announcement is our red friendship notepad, which should be located towards the beginning of your row. If you would take that and sign it and pass it down your row and then back up uh, once the last person signs it. This is just a Easy way for us to know who all is here this morning and gives you the chance to learn some new names. Secondly, I want to draw your attention to page 15, especially if you are a guest or someone looking to get uh, more plugged in at second. Uh, this QR code on page 15, it just gets you uh, connected to our director of engagement, Amanda Coop, and she would love to help you get more connected here. Uh, but if you would like to speak to her in person, immediately after the service and the connector, She'll be out there and uh, willing to talk to you if you would prefer that. On page 14, you'll see some important dates. We have our Inquirers class coming up on um, uh, April 19th through the 21st. So if you are looking to or interested in getting, uh, becoming a member here at Second, or if you just want to learn more about our church family, I would highly encourage you to take advantage of those dates. Uh, registration deadline is this Wednesday. And then also, you'll see our box uh, for summer is second. Uh, VBS registration is open. So um, do not wait till last minute because uh, June will be here uh, very quickly. In a few moments, we'll be having our prayers of intercession. And those details of those prayer requests uh, can be found on page 13 as well. And then lastly, I'd like to invite you all back here this evening as we continue with worship. When Philip James will be kicking us off with our study of First Peter. Now, this time I want to invite all the kids to the front because Miss Peggy Stevens has a very special word for you. Good morning, good morning. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I'm going to pull my little white seat up a little bit. Oh, those flowers are so beautiful today. Hey. Hey. Come on, 
fella, you can make it. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad to see you all this morning, and good morning, church family. You know, I have something so special to show you all this morning, and it is something that we've had for a long time in my family. What is this? A quilt. That's right, and my grandsons were in the early service, and they said, that's our picnic blanket, Jeej. And it is our picnic blanket. This blanket came to my husband when he was a young boy by a lady in his church named Mrs. Hancock. And Mrs. Hancock, if you look closely, can y'all see this? She sewed every bit of this with a needle and thread. And I often think about Mrs. Hancock when I use this quilt, and I use it all the time. We use it for picnics. When I take a nap on my screened-in porch, when it's a little cold, I put this around me, and I feel wrapped up in Mrs. Hancock's love. And at the time that she made it, she was older. And I wondered if while she was making this, if she thought, I am going to pray for the family that's going to have this quilt. And she knew she was giving it to my husband. So I, I always feel wrapped up in Mrs. Hancock's prayers. And she's gone now. She's gone to be with the Lord. But her quilt is still a very sweet gift. And today, Pastor George is going to talk to us from the book of Leviticus. I love that name. Can y'all say it? Leviticus, that's right. And he's going to talk in the couple of verses that he's going to talk to us about today. He's going to talk about the importance of old and young together. So in the verse, it talks about um, the promise of what a community can look like when it's blessed by the Lord. And that means that old folks and young folks and everybody in between come together, kind of like this quilt. Look at all the different pieces of fabric, all different colors, all different sizes. I mean, you don't see one that's the same, do you? And yet it all comes together. Miss Hancock put it all together, and it's one loving and lovely gift that we have cherished for many years. So it's kind of like put up this hand, and this is like you, the old hand, and put up this hand, and this is like the children. The scripture tells us that children are playing in the streets together with the old folks. And they come together, put your hands together, and join them, and then put these two up. And that's like our church. There's the steeple. It's like our church. So often out in the world, we're separated, right? We have children over here and old folks over here, and we're all just separated. But it's so important for all of us to come together. And if you look out at your church family right now, you see all kinds of people, all ages, and that's what's really, really special. There's another verse in the Bible that I want to share with you that kind of partners well with our Leviticus verse. And in that verse, it has these three words. Can you read those with me? Put on love. Put on love. Church family, put on love. And we're going to look at Colossians. Let me get my Bible open, my wonderful Bible, to Colossians 3, 12 through 14. And it gives us some good directions on how to live together, old and young, and make a difference in our community. And here's what it says. Listen up. See when you hear this. You're going to hear it, okay? So be listening. In fact, when you hear it, just raise your hand, okay? Don't be fooled by the first three because it's not this. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. So we've got to put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, like if there's a problem, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. That's a big one. Okay, be listening. It's coming. And above all, put on love. Ah, there it is. Which binds everything together 
in perfect harmony. And I always like leaving you all with a memory of a scripture, just something to kind of think about, okay? So say after me, Colossians 3.14. And church family, you can join us. Okay, you ready? And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Old and young and black and white and purple and everybody of all ages in perfect harmony. And we have that in our church and we learn in our church how to be together in perfect harmony. Let's pray to the Lord about that. Lord of love and God of harmony, ruler of all nations, thank you for the picture of what a community can be when we work together with kindness and patience and love. We love you, Lord, and we ask for your guidance to live and love together in our family, in our church family, in our city, and in our lives. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, Peggy, for that reminder that we have all been united in Christ. And as those who are united to one another, let us stand and go to the Lord with our prayers of intercession. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we join with Christ this morning, who is already interceding on our behalf, and who beckons all who are heavy laden to come to him, and he would give them rest. Lord, we pray for the family of Miriam Elizabeth Townsend on her death. And we pray for Sissy Nichols on the death of her sister, Anna Valerius. Lord Jesus, we pray that they would know your rest and the comfort of your Holy Spirit. And that you would remind them of the promise of everlasting life for those who are in Christ. Heavenly Father, we also praise you for the gift of new life. We pray for Grant and Kate Heflin on the birth of their son, James Michael Heflin. We also pray for Brian and Ellen Salowski on the birth of their daughter, Virginia Sloan Salowski. Holy Spirit, would you sustain these parents in these early stages of parenting and give them the grace needed to shepherd these little ones you have given into their care. We praise you for the gift of marriage. And this morning, we celebrate with Natalie Magnus and Matt Kurjic on their recent marriage. Lord, would you bless their marriage to be a reflection to those around them of Christ's love for his own bride. Lord, Father, we also pray for your mission to redeem all things and to make everything new. And that mission has taken place around the world. God, we thank you for Haley and the work that you have called her to in the Middle East. We thank you that she has gotten to see you move in remarkable ways. And now as she returns home, Lord, would you guide her and give her wisdom as she discerns the, this next season of life. And Lord, we thank you not only for the missions being done around the world, but even a mission taking place locally. God, we praise you for the ministry of Nathan Street. And we pray that you will continue to meet all of their needs, specifically for their internship program to continue. And God, we pray that the work that you are doing in the hearts of those children will bear much fruit. And lastly, Lord, we thank you for the work that you are doing here at Second. We lift up our sports and recreation ministry, and we pray that their ministry would be a blessing to many families in the city of Memphis, and that through sports, many would come to know Christ. Lord, these are but a few of our requests, and although there is much that we could pray and should pray for, 
We trust that you know exactly what we need before we even ask. And so instead, we choose to pray the way our Lord taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah to fight for me and I'm gonna see in the middle of the storm louder and louder gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive Hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a
Good morning, church. Good singing. It's interesting how many times in the Bible God sent the choir first against an enemy, not because he's trying to get rid of the choir, but because he was demonstrating his strength, his strength in the praises of his people is greater than all the armaments of men drawn up against his forces. Zechariah chapter 8, Zechariah chapter 8 is our text for study, verses 4 through 6. I know we've studied Zechariah uh, 8 before. We're back into the study of the minor prophets, but I want to go back and look very carefully at these three verses, really thematically at these three verses, because these are the text uh, for, the proof text for the middle portion of our mission at 2PC Memphis. We say that we are about the work of retelling the gospel and reimagining the church and the city and rebuilding and repairing what is broken. That middle portion, reimagining the church and the city, this is the proof text for that second portion of the middle portion, reimagining the city. When we say reimagining, it's really another word for reforming. We're constantly looking at Scripture and asking, what does God want? What does He want for the church according to Scripture? Well, then we are to reform it or repair it according to that vision given in Scripture. And then what does God want for the city, for every city, representing ultimately being drawn up into ultimately the city of God. What does God desire for every city? And when we find that our city is lacking in that, then we are reimagining it. We are working toward repairing it and reforming it according to God's vision. It's a biblical mandate. It's a biblical storyline. The humanity begins in the garden. God creates us in the garden, but history will end in a city the city of God, the city of the new Jerusalem, coming down and enveloping the whole world. God has called us not only, as one friend of mine used to say, not only to build a great church, but to build a great city. They must go hand in hand. It is like the relationship between a brain and the appendages of the body. The church is the brain. There, can be no, there, there cannot be a great city. There can't be a healthy city without the church doing what it is supposed to do. Just as the arms can't work if the brain is damaged in a certain way. Now the church can exist without the city. Sometimes we exist in exile. Sometimes we're underground. Sometimes we're persecuted, run out of cities. Just like an arm can be cut off but the brain continues on. But a church cannot be the church of Jesus Christ and not endeavor, strive for building not just a great community of the faithful, but to build a great city as a testimony to the coming kingdom of God. That's exactly what is envisioned in verses 4 through 6 of Zechariah chapter 8. And you can find that on page 796, and the Bible's provided for you in the pew. Listen to God's word. I'm going to go back up to verse 3, actually. Chapter 8, verse 3. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Zion, and I'll dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Remember, we're studying Zechariah, who is a prophet to the people of Israel who have come back, they've been restored from exile back to Jerusalem and they started building the city and left the church in ruins. They said, your church, your city cannot be what it is supposed to be until you restore the church to the center. Verse 4, thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women shall again sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each with staff in hand because of great age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in its streets. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if it is marvelous in the sight of the remnant of this people in those days, should it also be marvelous in my sight, 
declares the Lord of hosts. Brothers and sisters, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Let us pray together. Well, Lord, please open our eyes to see the new Jerusalem, to see with sanctified imagination the city of God that is coming and endeavor to reveal as much of it in this life as a testimony to that which is to come as possible. Empower us, Lord. Encourage us. Embolden us. And get a name for yourself, not just at Second Presbyterian in Memphis, but in Memphis, Tennessee. Get a name for yourself through a great church and a great city. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said together, amen. <clears throat> the first building program I ever led a church through, I've led three. The first one was in St. Louis. I was told by a wise mentor after the second building program, he said, uh, the Lord will help you with your first building program. The Lord will give you mercy in your second building program. The Lord will forgive you for the third building program. There will be no mercy or forgiveness if you go into a fourth. So I'm not introducing a building program here at second. But the first building program in St. Louis, who had all kinds of opposition. Uh, we'd gone through a church split. We had a, an adversarial neighborhood, adversarial city, and so forth. We didn't have any money. So it took years to plan what was needed. We whiteboarded a lot of things. We made ideas on pieces of paper and we hung them up and people drew sketches on the backs of napkins and so forth. But the day came when there was a green light with our city and our neighborhood to go forward and the people were ready. And so it was time finally to interview architects to take up the program. Architects came in one firm after another. There was one firm in particular that came the whole army of architects, and they came holding very reverently a briefcase. And they came and they put it on the table like this. And they said, we've taken all of your notes and all of your sketches, all of your ideas, and we've transformed them into this. And they opened the case, and out of it they took a scale model of everything that they, we had asked them to design. And we had... Uh, We had envisioned a sanctuary, so they said, this is the sanctuary that you have envisioned, and here's the Christian education building, and here's the welcome center that you, here's the school eventually that you, and every every idea that was two-dimensionally represented on a whiteboard somewhere was now transformed into a three-dimensional object. We could see it, we could touch it, we could feel it. It's very much what is envisioned in the Bible. The Bible gives us prescriptions or descriptions of what the church is to be, just like like Peggy described it. It's it's to be old and young and people of various colors and stations of life, and they're to be united in one body. Well, it's one thing to read it on paper. It's another thing to see it represented three-dimensionally, maybe even four-dimensionally in our congregation. And the same for the city. God says, I envision a day where there's a city where a diversity of people are living safely and joyfully in close proximity to each other. We're given that painting. And it's our high calling to see it effected to work toward it. We may never actually experience it, but we are working toward it. We are giving testimony to that which is coming in the future by reaching in by faith and pulling from the future into the present, God's vision, God's imagination for the city. Now, before I can make that point from this text, I want to, I want to answer that question that's in your outline, why are cities important? Why are cities important? A friend of mine and I were uh, recently in a a meeting in another city, and he and I both 
were reared in rural settings. We could look out and we could see pastoral landscapes, rolling hills, mountains in one case. And, and that's what, when, when, we, when we think of beauty, that's what we default to, those pastoral scenes. But God, in his humor, has called each of us always to urban ministry, cities, uh, ministry in cities, for me, small, medium, and large. And, and he said that he'll never forget the day my friend said when he was in Philadelphia and uh, an, an older mentor was walking him around the city and he said, uh, uh, Phil, what, is, what does God think is more beautiful? The countryside or a city? I felt said, that's easy, the countryside. God thinks that's prettier. Okay, Phil, here you are in, in Philadelphia. I want you to turn in a in 360 degrees and I want to tell you you tell me what do you see everywhere you look and he said people let me ask you the question again in your mind's eye go to those rolling hills the only uh, the only mammal you see is a four-legged one and now look and let me ask you Look at the city again. Which does Jesus say is more beautiful? The one with the most people. It doesn't mean that farms are not beautiful. It doesn't mean they're essential to our livelihood. We can't do without farms. But it's a matter of prioritization. Why does Jesus love cities? Because they're full of people. They're concentrations of people. The city we are in, we're called to love because it has got a concentration of people. The, answer to the, the simple answer to the first question, why are cities important, is because they're important to Jesus because Jesus loves people. Cities are not inventions of evil. Hey, that, that wouldn't make sense if the, if the final glorification of the of, of the redemptive work of Christ is, is a city, but, but cities are, are gifts of mercy to those who were expelled from the garden. Expelled from the garden, God gave cities. Build a city that can be a refuge for the most vulnerable. It'll be a concentration of resources, a place for protection, a place or a concentration of creativity and and social support for those who are in danger. And cities have evil in them. Cities are broken as we are. But just because they're broken, just because they're needy, does not mean that we're to give up on them. We're to leave them, to escape from them, because they're not so comfortable. Our friend Stephen Um, one of our uh, visiting preachers a couple of years ago has written a book called Why Cities Matter. And he says cities matter for three reasons. <clears throat> for one, they're a magnet. Another, they're an amplifier. A third, they're a gateway. They're a magnet, first of all. Cities are magnets of creativity. The major uh, worldviews and theories and uh, insights that have been the most socially impactful have come from cities. So those who study cities call it creative density. The creative density. This is where the, the creators, the cultivators of culture are concentrated in cities. Not always good impacts on the world, but they are whatever they conspire together to form makes a difference, often worldwide, whether it's in the arts, whether it's in the, the academy, uh, whether it's in finance. And so Christians, but if Christians are going to make a difference in culture, ultimate, in a, in a, in a large way, there must be Christians present in that process. Christians need to be in the room where it happens. 
Christians, gospel-centered Christians, if they want to make gospel-centered impact, an impact that is truly flourishing for those made in the image of God, they must be at those tables. They, They mustn't run from them as we have tended to do. We've tended to run away from them, to separate from them, to flee from them, and then we cast our aspersions or we cast our critiques back. We criticize the culture. We critique it. We critique politics. We critique the arts. We critique social theory. We will gain, we will only gain leverage and influence and authority to speak into and to cultivate and create positive a positive impact on culture if we are in the mix, if we're moving toward the need, involving ourselves in those concentrations of creativity. You should ask, what can you bring to it? Is it getting more involved in the in politics? Is it getting more involved in planning communities? Is it getting more involved in education? Is it getting more involved in uh, the way business will impact our city, ask the question, hold your hands open to the Lord and say, I am in this city and you have given me resources at the right hand of the Father through Jesus Christ. Please use me to make an impact on this city that will affect others, maybe even others around the globe. There are magnets for creativity. There are magnets for the poor. Cities are magnets for the poor. I remember an interview with George W. Bush after he had left the presidency, and he said that he had he had interviewed on or he was meeting on one occasion with with um, a dictator of, of of another country, and he he asked the dictator, "What is it that keeps you up at night?" And he said, what keeps me up at night is that the rural poor will discover the resources in the city and all move there at once and deplete the resources for the rest of us. Well, he, he, he understands that what tends to happen in cities. Cities attract the poor. And far from that being a negative thing for Christians, it must be a positive thing because the Father, the God illustrates very clearly in His Word the emphasis on the poor, over a over hundred, well over a hundred verses in the Bible dedicated to the poor, demonstrating God's heart of compassion and mercy for the poor. We should see it as here is a place to do in a concentrated way that which is most important to the Father in terms of social impact, not just leading people to personal faith in Jesus Christ, but demonstrating that the gospel rescues them out of the cyclical hopelessness that they are in. Hey, the the Bible is is very clear, isn't it? When God says in in, uh, James, real religion, true religion is to minister to the orphan, the widow, the poor. In the Old Testament, he said, there shall be no poor among you. In the New Testament, in the church by Acts chapter 4, they were beginning to put that into practice. It said, in the church, there were no poor among them. There must be, there must not be. We must be, especially in the church, warring against cyclical poverty. And then by extension, bringing the same release to those around us. By changing things, by equipping people in such a way that they escape that hopelessness and to do it all in the name of Jesus. There's some practical ways that we're involved in that right now. We're involved with Forward Memphis, for instance, which is an alternative, a private-public partnership of, of providing an alternative to payday lending. It involves Financial literacy involves accountability. It involves, it involves a spiritual counseling. It involves microloans. Christians brought that about. And then we're involved in Advanced Memphis, for instance, and, and teaching financial literacy there. We're involved with the Rise to Read, teaching kids to read at grade level by, by grade three or the end of grade two so that they will not be on a destiny to poverty as will be the case if they don't learn to read. 
We're attacking poverty in all kinds of different directions. In the name of Jesus. Cities are magnets for the poor. Then they are magnets for searchers. People come to the cities as immigrants or as young people looking for something new. And they're open to new ideas. And they are, they are ripe for presenting the gospel. Coming into a relationship with him. Refugee empowerment is one of those outreach. World relief or our sports ministries or our adults involved in adult sports leagues. And then two other reasons that cities matter is that they are not only magnets, but they're amplifiers. What has been the tendency throughout the last, from since the 1950s, has been for people to move out of cities to the suburbs. And the cities, like a hole in the donut, have continued to decay. And what we've noticed around the country, around the world, is as the city goes, also goes the suburbs. So now what is happening with gentrification, as those who have uh, money and means move back into cities, they drive the poor or the, or the problems and or problems out to the suburbs. It's not that some of these cities that we are so excited about as they've come alive in their, in their downtowns, it's not like everybody is prospering equally. But rather, the problems, the, the social problems, the economic problems have been displaced to the suburbs. So don't think that just because you're living in the suburbs, you can ignore the city of Memphis and all will continue to go well. This, whatever goes poorly in a city is magnified and has repercussions for the surrounding area. What goes well for the city is also highly amplified. And then it's a gateway. It's a gateway for the gospel. More important than, than economic prosperity is the idea of the kingdom of God spreading through individual conversions. And that's been the history uh, of the spread of the gospel. In 1900, there were 14%. 14% of the world's population was concentrated in urban settings. By 1950, 30%. By 2008, 50%. By 2020, 74%. By the end of the century, it's projected that 90% of the world's population will be concentrated in urban centers around the world. Now, why is that important to missions? Why is it important to evangelism? Here's the way the church grew. The church in A.D. 100 had 25,000 members. 100 A.D., 100 years after the turn of that first century, there were 25,000 members of the church. By A.D. 310, there were 20 million how did it grow so quickly? It was by, we can read about the strategy in Paul's three journeys. He went to the major cities of the world. And Christians continued to go to the major cities of the world, especially to the, to the east in those first uh, 400, 500 years. It wasn't that the rural populations were ignored. The, the rural populations were reached after those major cities were reached, where a church was planted there. This is a gateway for the gospel to spread. So whatever we invest in a city, economically, uh, educationally, socially, spiritually, will be amplified many times over as the kingdom of God spreads from city to city. Why should cities matter to us? Because they matter to Jesus. They matter to Jesus because they're concentrations of people, people who are vulnerable especially. So what are we to do about it? How do we build a city that is glorifying to God? Well, we build it the way by imitating Jesus. We imitate Jesus who considered, who did not consider his needs first, according to Philippians 2. He did not consider his own interests first, but the interests of others. He left his throne, the, the, the safety 
of the ultimate suburbia in heaven. And he moved into our neighborhood. And he took up everything that he might redeem from the inside out all that is broken in this world. We imitate his incarnational love. That is by moving closer to the need rather than trying to escape it. We pray every week, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for the kingdom to come, the rule of Christ to come. That means, first of all, if if you have never bowed the knee to Christ, you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you must do that first. You must accept that you are, that you are, that you're in need of his forgiveness, that his blood must be, must cover your sins, your sins placed on the cross. And then out of gratitude for that, you yield up to him everything that you are and have. And you say, you are Lord of everything. And as Lord of your life, then you say, I want you to tell me what to do. Tell me what to do individually. You want me to read the word. You want me to pray. You want me to share my faith. You want me to go to church. Tell me where you want me to serve. Where are you calling me? You're calling me to this city. You're calling me to the country there. You're calling me to another country. Wherever you call me, whatever situation to which you call me, you call me, I will go. But not only individually, but we strive to say, I want It is my calling to bring the kingdom of God, the rule of Christ to bear on my vocation, in my family, my neighborhood, my business, my city. What does it look like when we bring the kingdom of God to bear on a a city like we have stewardship of? The Bible says this, Paul says that uh, the kingdom of God is not a matter of rules, it is a matter of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Bringing the kingdom of God is not a matter of telling people what they're not supposed to do, but rather come to something better. Come to righteousness, come to peace, come to joy. That's exactly what we have in these three verses. It's righteousness, first of all. You saw it in verse 3. He saw that Jerusalem would be called a faithful city. Those words are almost interchangeable. Faithfulness or righteousness or justice. Justice, as one person used to say, is giving each person his due or her due, whether it is for prosperity or whether it is for punishment or whether it is for personal care. Every person their due. Or we can look at it another way. It is whatever the Bible says is God's will, conforming ourselves to it is a matter of justice or righteousness. And conforming institutions to it is also a matter of justice or righteousness. Those words are used interchangeably throughout Scripture. Righteousness. Righteousness is to come to a city to make it faithful, just as it's envisioned here. One uh, author said, one Old Testament scholar said, the righteous, the people who do righteousness, the people who have been made righteous, that is, they've been justified by the the free gift of, of Christ in his blood, the righteous are willing to disadvantage themselves for the advantage of the community. The wicked are willing to disadvantage their community for the advantage of themselves friend of this church, Drew Holcomb, now the famous singer, once said uh, in, comparis- in comparing the city where he now lives and with the one he grew up in, Memphis, he said about the city where he now lives, he said, I feel like everybody comes to this city to get, whereas everyone comes to Memphis to give. What is the calling of Christians? It's to bring righteousness. It's to bring faithfulness. It's to bring justice. That's been the impetus of the Christian church forever. 
All of the things that we count most dear or that we consider as, as um, characteristic of, of uh, shalom and wellness are things that the Judeo-Christian worldview led toward. When God said to his people in Old Testament Israel, hey, Judah, I want you to pray for the peace of the city of Babylon. What did Christians do then? What have they done ever since? They've said, what's broken in this city? There's no health care. There are no human rights. Uh, babies are being thrown away. Women are being abused. Uh, authority is overbearing. Power is used against the vulnerable. Uh, sexual infidelity is, is carried out against the weakest. We've got to change that. It's unsafe. We need law keeping. Christians have moved toward that. Well, what is happening now? Christians have said, if that is not provided for me, I'm going to go somewhere else. These Christians said, wherever the need is, we move toward the need because we're royal priests. We are those who connect heaven to earth. We know that all the resources of God are in Christ at the right hand of the Father. So we step toward need and we bring those things to bear and communities improve. But now we've changed and we've said, if it's not brought to me, I'm going to leave and go find it elsewhere. That's not imitating Jesus. Who considered the interests of others as more important than his own and loved others more than he did himself. Thank the Lord Jesus didn't run from our need. Righteousness, we bring it. The right making of things, we bring it to where it's broken. And when we do, there is peace. That great word of the Old Testament, the Hebrew word shalom, occurs 250 times in the Old Testament, 90 times by its equivalent in the New Testament. And it's not just the absence of war, it is the completion, it is wholeness. So those who have done a lot of thinking about the way to renew cities, like uh, those uh, in this community who came together under the leadership of uh, Sandy Wilson and Fenton Wright and others in the Shalom Project, they ask, where what, what does it look like when the peace of God comes to a community? What are the characteristics of it? How could we measure its incremental success? And they identified a number of things. And all those things could be subsumed under several headings. It, it, there's beauty. There's learning. There's wholeness of body and soul. There's prosperity. There's unity and diversity. Those are all marks. Those are things that are necessary to human beings flourishing. And because God has made us in his image, that's what he wants for those who bear his image. That's what peace is. And here it's characterized very vividly, isn't it? It's not only a righteous city. When the city is righted, then peace, holistic healing comes such that the most vulnerable citizens of the city, old men and old women who, are, who have to lean on their staffs, they don't move like they once did, and children, another vulnerable population, can be full of joy playing in the streets. The streets are safe. We move toward that. We move toward communities there where it is not safe and we endeavor to bring safety there. I'll never forget the time we, in, in the previous church I pastored and there was no grass in the city. And we just needed a play, playing field so we, we put a fence around a vacant piece of property we'd purchased and we planted grass. And we had vacation Bible school there, and before they couldn't go outside, it was too dangerous to go outside at all, but this time they were able to play out in the streets. And when the children's voices, when the children started making voices, I saw windows in a neighbor in the, in the surrounding office buildings. The windows flew up, and people stuck their heads out of the windows thinking, what in the world is happening here? 
We haven't heard children's voices in 40 years. I remember a, 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 after several families had moved into the most distressed area of our community and they got their children together one night on Halloween and they had a trunk or treat thing, you know, in a vacant field that we had bought and we mowed it and we, we put out the stuff there and the children were around there and they started singing hymns and an old lady walked out of her house, down her steps, across the street and to the field with tears in her eyes and she said, for 40 years I've prayed that I could come out of my house and walk across that street and not fear that I was going to get killed. And here I am singing hymns with you. That's the vision that we're looking for. Read about it here. Work toward realizing it on this earth in whatever small place, one at a time. Peace and joy, playing, laughing with joy. God says, it may be marvelous in your sight, but it's not marvelous in my sight. It's why I sent my son. It is to bring the kingdom to bear through the church on the earth. To bring joy. The righteous the Bible says, Proverbs 11, verse 10, when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Tim Keller used to say, the righteous are to rejoice a city. When you prosper in any way, in your family, financially, socially, it is not for the sake of giving you the liberty to run from need. He gives you prosperity that you might bring rejoicing to places that are not prospering. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. As we, proper, as we prosper in beauty and learning and wholeness and unity and diversity and in prosperity, we are success. We are to leverage those things for the rejoicing of our city. Let me bring it home this way. In the spirit of the masters, my drive is going to start way right and then it's going to come back, unlike my actual drive. So you're going to say, where am I going? But hang with me. Last week I was <clears throat> back, I was uh, uh, I had dinner with, with uh, a family I formerly pastored. And we were remembering the old days and we, we recalled a woman who grew up in our, in our church. I didn't know her when she was young. But she had grown up in our church. She was a brilliant journalist up until about age 20. And then she was afflicted with a severe bipolar disease. And she became totally disconnected from reality. But as she moved toward greater need, the congregation moved closer to her. And they helped her get settled in a new place. They helped provide for her. They would have her over for things. They would include her in things. They would, they, um, they would at times have her over to their house overnight. It wasn't easy because she never slept. And she was loud. And she wasn't always pleasant. In this particular family I was eating with, remembered that they had brought her over one night because she was constantly getting kicked out of her care homes. And uh, they had to take her in one night. And so they locked all the doors to the children's room in their own bedroom. And she wandered around all night just wandering. They loved her. There was never any prospect that she was going to get better. She got worse year by year by year. And shortly before I had to make that horrendous call to have authorities pick her up and put her in a place where she could be kept safe and where she, and then eventually she went into a more permanent location near her sister and she passed away 
shortly before that, we realized that we were going to have to coordinate her care. We were going to have to have a care plan. So I called everybody together who had a hand in her life. It was 50 people. 50 people were supporting and encouraging one person, special need. There was never any prospect. We didn't say in that meeting, you know, we just feel like we're right around the corner. We feel like we're on the tipping point. If you just hang in there a little longer, she's going to get better. Everything's going to be, no, that, was, that, that wasn't the case. We couldn't say that. She is going to get worse and worse and worse. And we have to get closer and closer and closer. She never got better until she went to heaven. This friend I was having dinner with said, can you imagine when we see Anna? She's going to be whole. And I think she's going to find the 50 and she's going to say, thank you for not giving up on me. The Bible says in Revelation, the kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. The kingdoms, the cities of this world someday will become subsumed under the city of God and all will be conformed precisely to what Jesus wants them to be and he will rule them directly. And they will be beautiful. And they will know the Lord and what they need to know to to prosper. They will be whole. There will be unity and diversity. There will be prosperity and success for eternity. The city of Memphis someday will be glorified. Right now she's broken. Right now she's high maintenance. Right now, she's not loved anywhere. She's at the bottom of every scale. She's made fun of. And she's being abandoned. The day will come when she's made beautiful. And I want to be there. And I want to hear her say thank you for not giving up on me. And you do too, apparently, by the way you act, the way you serve. There are plenty of ways to serve. You want to know one? Sign that pew pad. Say, I want to serve in the city somewhere. We'll get you involved. Let's love our city. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what you give to us. It is not easy. Each one of us is given a cross. You call us to hard things. And by enduring in the hard things, we are assured that we will rejoice in glory. We will hear the well done, good and faithful servant. We especially thank you that you do not leave us on our own. But as you call us to make disciples of all the nations, you say you are with us even to the end of the age. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards of every area of influence you have given to us, whether it is a city or a family or, or a place in the country or wherever it is, make us good stewards that at the great day we would lift it up to you and hear it say, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Alleluia, find the glory. Alleluia, we sing. Alleluia, find the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee. Stretch forth your hands for God's blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the abundant love of the Heavenly Father and the empowerment, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit go and abide with you all now and forever. Go in his peace. Amen. Amen.